Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday school. Glad you guys are with us this morning. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide there, Miss Gracie. Awesome. Thank you much. So we're in Philippians chapter 4 this morning, and uh, I, I ran into Brian in the office, and uh, as he is wont to do, he typically asks me, you know, what are you teaching about today? And I said, we're in Philippians chapter 4, and I said, we're finally going to get to verse 13. And he kind of raised one eyebrow. And I said, and I'm going to make as little to do about that as I possibly can. And he smiled and nodded, so I I feel good about where we're headed today. So let's go ahead and read uh, Philippians chapter 4, and we'll pick up, uh, Lord willing, in just a minute, on page 106. We will spend zero seconds on 106, uh, and then move very quickly to 108. So Philippians chapter 4, and I'm going to start with verse 2, and read down through the end of the chapter. Philippians 4. I urge Euodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because, once again, you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my need several times. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. But I have received everything in full, And I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Philippians chapter 4. Well, good morning to those of you online as well. I know there's several of you there. I appreciate you all joining with us. We're on page 106 in the green book. Um, Soon not to be green. Little teaser there. I'm not going to tell you what uh, part of the color wheel we're moving to next. Uh, I don't know that I could accurately describe it, but uh, it is not a Roy G. Biv color. So there you go. I will struggle immensely. So page 106 is the Greek text of our next to last pericope uh, in uh, Philippians. And this is, this is really, the, we, we begin here into these sections in our English Bibles. So if you go to page 107, uh, it's titled Appreciation of Support here, this uh, section, verses 10 through 20. Uh, in our, generally in our English Bibles, at the end of a, an epistle, you end up with these kind of big sections of personal greetings and shout-outs and hello and thank you for this and commend so-and-so and like give somebody the side eye and some, just some basic, uh, very personal-oriented things that are going on here. And a lot, of, a lot of English translations struggle to describe what's going on, but Paul helps uh, our English translators here quite a bit because this... Basically, this whole first paragraph is just, thanks so much for your support. Um, And the second paragraph is, thanks again for your support. It was really good. 
Uh, and and this, is, this is one of the ways that we know that Paul loved the Philippians, is the, the degree and the length to which he spends in this pericope on saying thank you and I love you, which I think is just a beautiful thing. So I don't want to miss that as we dive deep into the weeds here in just a second. So page 108, we'll start at the bottom of page 108 there with a word-by-word analysis. So I, I, will, I will tell you this. This is some of the trickiest Greek in all of Philippians, the pericope that we're going to look at today. And there are a wide variety of ways that you can lean into or emphasize or de-emphasize specific parts of these sentences. Uh, lots of words are left out for clarity in our English speaking. Uh, and lots of words in English are added to fill in the gaps between the uh, the very brief number of words that Paul uses in the original language. So just be aware of that. So verse 10, uh, and I rejoiced. So um, Mitch, I'm coming back to you here because this is another passive rejoicing verb, right? So this was something that, that happened to Paul that caused him to rejoice. It was done to the speaker, which I think is just really beautiful. Uh, and I, I just put your finger there on page 108 because I want you to see why he rejoiced. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because, so he actually gives us the reason for his rejoicing. Once again, you renewed. So there was something that the Philippians did that caused Paul to rejoice. So at the bottom of page 108, our first application for today, uh, joy can be caused. That was a beautiful catch. I'm just going to say that, that was... There was some fumbling that went along under this table right here, and Dave made a Spider-Man worthy. I'm actually kind of sad the camera wasn't pointed that way because <laughs> I saw the catch, and I am super distracted right now. So, Oh, maybe that's an example. That might be an example of like literally what I'm just talking about. Like that, I got really excited because you did something that create. You see what I'm saying here? Yeah, it wasn't deliberate. That's exactly right. That's, that's really good. That's really good. That's really good. It wasn't deliberate. I like that quite a bit. Um, so my personalization here, and these are going to more than rhyme today, so just FYI, uh, is rejoice. Is rejoice. Because we can cause joy. And I, I think we ought to just rejoice for just a second in the fact that we can cause joy. Like, this is good. Like, you can do things in somebody else's life in our congregation that can cause joy. So, I dare you. <laughs> like, let's go do that. You know, it's fantastic. Joy can be caused. So let's, let's rejoice because we can cause joy. Uh, and then I, I just, I cannot get away from how thrilled I am to have gotten to soak in Philippians so much uh, over the last year. This is week uh, 48, I believe it is, so... Booyah, that's awesome. Uh, and watch Paul ground everything in the Lord, right? I rejoiced in the Lord. So this is, the, the Lord is the center of Paul's joy here. It is not a, it is not a, like, well, I rejoiced in you. Not exactly, not exactly. Because what do we know, we know, what do we know about the Philippians? Are they perfect people? No. no. So are they capable of, holding the weight of our emotional center. You're like, not, not if you want it to be steady. <laughs> and, right, I mean, this is, this is how we live our lives. I put, I put all of my eggs in this one emotional basket, and that basket lets me down, and you're like, well, what, why am I sad? I, I centered my joy in the wrong thing, right? This is just not helpful. So, application, the bottom page 109 the Christian's joy is centered in God. The Christian's joy is centered in God. The Christian's joy is centered in God. So what do we do with that? Rejoice! Because God's not moving and because I don't have to bear that weight. Like I, this is one of the things I love about Christianity is that it's not up to me. Like It's been accomplished and, and we get to revel in the already accomplished and look forward to what's not yet accomplished. Like, this is, what a beautiful time to be alive. It's great. So I rejoiced in the Lord greatly 
Uh, does anybody know what sequel is coming out? Uh, has already come out. I think it's in theaters this coming weekend or maybe this, this past weekend. It's about a giant animal in the sea. The Meg, yes, this is, this is the Greek word, megalos. It's the exact same concept. There's your movie reference for today. Check. We're going to hit all the Jim Fleming highlights today. Uh, so I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. This is a lot. It's the only time this word's used in the New Testament, which is kind of crazy. Because, so there's a, there's a reason. This is the, we're going to explain. Because once again, and here the Greek makes no sense whatsoever to me. I will tell you this. Um, uh, the, the two words here mean even now at some time ever. I'm like, how would we get to once again? But that's the, this is the standard way to say once again, and I'm just going to trust the 47 books that I read on this, that they are all in alignment, that that's what is going on. Uh, so I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed. So again, we see this reason for Paul's joy. The center of Paul's joy is God, but the reason for Paul's joy is that they, these Philippians did something. So top of page 110, this is a, a plural word, so he's not talking specifically to some individual in Philippi. He's talking to the, the church as a whole. Uh, and the word just means to revive. Uh, I looked this up in several different dictionaries. This is a really good definition. It means to revive. Um, to, to, in, it, it's this reinvigorating, encouraging, kind of a, like, you blow air into a fire, and you see the fire, you're like, here we go, this is good. So you renewed your care. So if you renewed care, what does that, what does that tell you about they had done something before, and now they're doing it again, and this is encouraging them each time, and we're going to see a lot of really amazing stuff here. So we, you renewed your care, and this is an interesting translation. I, um, I don't want to be critical here, but every other time in the New Testament when this word is used, it is translated as thinking because it's, it's phreneo. It's the, to think about something, to focus on something. Um, and, and it has, in its semantic range, the idea of caring. It, it is there. Like you can, you can absolutely translate it that way. It's just the only time it's translated this way in the entire New Testament. And I'm like, okay, that's, you, you, you're leaning into one part of the definition, and I think it works very well, because if you were to say, uh, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your thinking for me. I didn't, it, especially in the context of this paragraph that is talking about giving and taking the feeling and making it very tangible. And we're going to see that, that the CSB does that several times in this pericope. They will look at the semantic range and they will lean into the tactical, tangible, physical part of the definition of a word. Um, and this is really one of those, it's a really beautiful text because you can see where the translators went the whole way through and what part of the range they leaned into, which I think is, this is like next level hard. So, just I want to acknowledge that. Uh, so, you renewed your thinking, your care for me. So, he gets very personal here again. This is a personal pronoun for me. Um, and I will say that whether it's care or whether it's thinking, I, what I've got in my application in the bottom of page 110 is Christians focus on each other. Like, their focus was on Paul, and they turned that focus into action. Like, there was some, there was some thing that happened as a result. It wasn't just... Well, I, I thought about you, sending thoughts your way. I struggle sometimes, guys, I'll just be honest. When I hear somebody say, well, we're thinking about you. Like the sarcastic Jim wants to go, well, thank you for articulating the fact that you are literally doing nothing. Like that is so awesome and helpful in every way because your thoughts can't help me, <laughs> right? Pray for me, show up, encourage, rebuke, well, like do something here, right? I'm channeling my Dave Barber. Like just like get active in some way. And this is what the Philippians did. They did. It's beautiful. In the bottom of page 110, you were, in fact, uh, <laughs> 
uh, concerned. Now, do you see the word uh, concerned? Do you see the, the Greek word uh, before the word concerned? This is where I have a mistake in your green book. So that bracket for to exercise the mind, to think about, that should be after the word concerned, not before the word concerned. Do you see that at the top of page 111? That G5426 for Neo, that is, in fact, the word concerned. So I've got an error in my grid. So just a little arrow. This happens every 40 or 50 pages, so sorry. We'll get it corrected in the uh, final edition. <laughs> sure. But it is a plural, imperfect, active indicative. So this is repeatedly happening in the past. So the imperfect is repeatedly happening in the past. So you were, in fact, is a good translation because you were, past tense, concerned, past tense. You were repeatedly concerned about me in the past. You're like, that's, that's good. This is good. We, we want to be concerned about those that we love. And, and then this really strange phrase at the bottom, but you lacked the opportunity. What do you mean you lacked the opportunity? Well, this is also an imperfect. So they repeatedly, in the past, lacked the opportunity. At the top of page 112, this word opportunity means it's out of season or without occasion. It, it just, stuff didn't line up so that it could actually occur, right? Have, have you ever, you, like, you, you looked and you saw a situation, you're like, ooh, 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 I, I can inject myself right here, and this will work really well, we'll be able to help, and then all of a sudden it just vanishes. You're like, but, but like, I, uh, and this happened to them repeatedly. They lacked the opportunity. So back on page 111, bottom of page 111, sorry, I had to go to 112 to give you the definition of the word, kind of come back. It's just, Green book. Fun today. Uh, bottom of page 111, the application. Uh, Christian desire to help may not always be fulfillable. Christian desire to help may not always be fulfillable. We, we may see something and just... Man, I just didn't get to do it. I wanted to. I saw it repeatedly, and I didn't get to do it. Now, let me ask you the, the Sunday school question, All right. so you know what the answer is, right? Who is taking care of Paul? Jesus is taking care of Paul, that's right. He is absolutely taking care of Paul. Sometimes he does it directly, sometimes he does it through angels, sometimes he does it through people, sometimes he does it through nature, sometimes he does it through anything that is under his sovereign control in the entire universe that he made. Cool, but Jesus is taking care of Paul. And Jesus knew that the Philippians were concerned, and he knew that they, he lacked the, they lacked the opportunity. And did Paul starve? No, because Paul's still writing Philippians. So please understand, so when Christian desire to help may not always be fulfillable, you know what we do? We rejoice, which is going to sound strange. It's, it's going to sound strange. One, because we're not ultimately responsible for, like, the life that somebody has. And two, love for the brothers and sisters is evidence of conversion. Like, this is one of those things you're like, well, okay. <laughs> you know, we have a time of examination when we take communion. And one of the things that we're supposed to be examining is our walk with the Lord. And are we, in fact, in Christ? Is there evidence in our lives of the fact that we are in Christ. It's like, okay, cool. So you run down through the fruits of the Spirit, and the first one is what? Love. Okay. Do I love the brothers and the sisters? Is there evidence of that? Can I see that? Could somebody stand up in court and go, yes, I can testify that you love the brothers and sisters. This would be evidence. This is good. This is good. So, they were, in fact, concerned about him, but lacked the opportunity. Uh, to show it is just kind of some added 
language in the English that helps flesh out the thoughts. Not really there in the Greek, but uh, then we get to verse 11. I don't say this out of need. So what, is, like, what does that mean? I don't say this out of need. He didn't have a need right there, right? What's he about to say in just a second? Down in uh, verse 18, I am fully supplied. I have a hard time not reading this like, I am fully supplied. Because the guy on BibleGateway.com who reads the CSB says it that way. And I love that particular inflection. I think that's just, I think it gets to the heart of way, the way Paul's saying it right now. He's not starving right now. But where is he? <laughs> Y'all get that? Like, he wasn't always in prison. <laughs> like, there were actually times in Paul's ministry where he was not in jail himself. Like, we're going to spend a ton of time over the next few years talking about this part of Paul's life where he was actually in jail. But there was more time in his life where he was not in jail. But right now, in jail, chained to a Roman guard, I don't say this out of need. Like just let's not miss that one, right? This is just another one of those, whoa, pretty awesome. Uh, yes, sir. I think you are right. Uh, for those of you online that couldn't hear what uh, Mitch said, he said, uh, I think Paul would have said that even if he didn't have great physical need. Because what's Philippians been about? Right, it's been about the, the unity in the body of Christ, the rejoicing that comes from that because of what Christ has done. The center of all of this, he's just said on the prior page, actually the prior line, if you've not got a, a book that splits these up just like this, I rejoiced in the Lord. It's pretty awesome. So I don't say this out of need. For, so he's going to explain that. Uh, I have learned. Now, this is an active indicative at the top of page 113. I have learned. Active means the subject is actively doing the work. Indicative, it is a fact. So this is a Paul-driven fact. I have learned to be content. You're like, well, what does content mean? Content, it's a really good translation. It's the only time this particular word for content is used in the New Testament. But that's a really good translation. It's just content. So what's our application on the bottom of page 113? Contentment can be learned. Contentment can be learned. What do you think we ought to do with that? <sighs> rejoice. Yes. I guess we have to rejoice about this too. Yes. We get to rejoice. We get to rejoice. Because it is possible in Christ. Sitting in a prison cell, chained to a guard, writing your friends who you desperately, with tears in your eyes, want to see because they love you so much. Missing Epaphroditus who risked his life, sounds to me like multiple times, to go bring me stuff on your behalf and I've learned to be content. Now, here's where the Greek gets super wonky. So I'll, I'll just give you a real wooden, literal translation here. Uh, learned uh, to be content in what I exist. I've learned to be content in what I exist. And a real smooth doubt nice, consistent, correct way to say that in English is in whatever circumstances I find myself. Like, that's a good way to translate that. Because I do not go around saying I exist. <laughs> right? That's kind of obvious because, like, you see me. But this is a present active indicative. This is what he is uh, enduring in life right now. So I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. And then verse 12 is going to be the, if I were in charge of the punctuation in the universe, I would have put a colon at the end of the word myself, not a period, because he's about to explain and further describe what he's talking about. He's going to give us some examples. 
right? And in true Pauline fashion, he's going to give the extremes. Because Paul likes talking about the extreme low and the extreme high and the extreme low and the extreme high and then Jesus, right? Like that's the Pauline structure. So I know how to, I'm on page 114, make do with little. And, and this is another one of those words that the, the, um, the way it's translated everywhere else in the New Testament, not just in the Pauline occurrences, but everywhere else in the New Testament, all other 13 uh, examples of this in the New Testament, this is translated as humbled. You're like, humbled? Like, what is that? How do, we get, how do we get make do with little from humbled? Like, well, what's the context? Again, the context is in the giving and receiving of support for Paul as he is doing his work. And he is going to do the extremes here. The, if I, when I am humbled and have little and am low, right? Uh, this actually, it's words used in Philippians 2.8 of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, uh, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Well, at that point in our Lord Jesus Christ's existence, uh, he needed food. When he became flesh on earth, he then needed food to survive and to be sustained. Part of the humbling. To depress, to humiliate. So I I know how to make do with little, to be low. And I know... Now, did you, did you see this? I don't, know that I, I don't know that I focused on this. At the bottom of page 113, that's a perfect active, that, that uh, morphology for that Greek wor- verb there. So perfect means it's completed action in the past with the results felt now. So he learned at some point prior to going to prison how to be content in all things, in all situations. So he knew before, and then verse... Uh, they're here again. I know how. This is another perfect active indicative. So this is something he learned before he went to prison. Which I, I don't know how to articulate this, but there's something there about learning big truths before we have to live them. Right? You, you see where that is? It's in there somewhere. and I, just, I don't know how to articulate it. I thought about it a lot yesterday and I couldn't get it wrapped around into a, a succinct statement so I know how to make do with a lot and look at the make do with a lot word that's a present active present active means when right now where is he right now in prison Paul is describing his current state as I have a lot (laughs) is that the most Pauline thing ever he's just (laughs) Now, I would argue that, Mitch, you are true in fact here. I think Paul, in fact, does have a lot of provisions and supplies and support because that's what this whole section is about. You guys have been taking care of me. Now, the situation immediately outside of that is grim and terrible and dark and all the things and whatever, but... He does have a lot right there. He's been taken care of. He's telling them, right now, I have a lot, and this is good. So something that I think we learned from page uh, 113 and 114, application at the bottom here, uh, contentment should not be situational. Contentment should not be situational. So what do we do with that? Rejoice. Because we can be content whenever we choose. I did not like the taste of those words that they came out of my mouth, Matt. I will tell you that. <laughs> it, does it, total to it does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, contentment should not be situational, so rejoice because we can be content whenever we choose. So I know how to make do with a lot. And this is beautiful Greek. This is just beautiful Greek. It's in any and in all. The word circumstances isn't there in the, uh, 
in the Greek, but I, th- I think it's a great addition in the English to help us understand the context. In any and in all, like, you, you pick the place, you pick the volume. Like, you, at any point, anywhere, I have learned. Now, this one's tricky. This is a perfect, right? So this is completed action with the results felt in the present. So this is something that happened in the past, but it's a passive. Something caused Paul to learn. You're like, well, that seems very interesting. Let's, let's dig just a smidge into this word. So the, the, only, uh, the only BDAG reference today is uh, this word, uh, and it is uh, mueo, uh, which s- sounds like we're in a cow field, but that's just kind of, and I, like the guy who pronounces it on Blue Letter Bible, I'm like, every time I hear it, I hear my grandfather, like getting the cows up, like it's exactly what it sounds like, so uh, go shovel, there we go, all right, uh, it means to initiate into the mysteries, So there was something that you didn't understand that's hard to get, that's hard to kind of grasp and get your head around, and you get initiated into this space. So there was something that was hard to understand, and now you're being moved into a new place of understanding. And I use those words very particular, you're being moved into, because this is a passive. So Paul was brought into a place where he was able to understand a mystery. So when you hear... This text be read, and it says, In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content. That secret of being content part there is all wrapped up into this word initiate. It's the, you've been initiated into the mystery. It's a really rich word, and it, it kind of breaks my heart that it's only mentioned, it's only used one time in the whole Bible. So, interesting stuff. Uh, so I will, I will say one of the applications at the bottom of page 115 is Christians are taught some mysteries. Christians are taught some mysteries. Now, we know we're not taught all mysteries because there are things that Paul references elsewhere in the New Testament that he leaves as a mystery. Like, this is a mystery, or that's a mystery, or, this is a mystery. And you get to the end of the paragraph, and you're like, hey, Paul, it sounds like it's still a mystery. I don't think you explained it, man. And, and he didn't. And so we ought to let mysteries be mysteries when they're not explained. But sometimes we get to understand things that are kind of cool. So what I would say to that is, Let's rejoice, because I don't have to go figure it all out on my own. Ha ha. Sometimes I'm going to be taught things, and this is really nice. <laughs> now, that's not an excuse to go be lazy, but sometimes we're going to be taught things. So in any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether, so let's go, thank you, Dave. Uh, uh, whether, now watch, watch me for just a second. Everybody watching me for just a second? Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. So you see the extremes that Paul uses here. So he's, he's, we're we're yo-yoing back and forth between the yay and the no and the yay and the no. And then we get to verse 13. So let me ask you this. What's our context for verse 13? Are we talking about scoring a goal in a soccer tournament? No. No. Because they didn't do that at all this morning, and they got their butts beat, and it made me aggravated. So that's all I'm going to say about that. <clears throat> the World Cup is going on right now. <laughs> Y'all are like, but we're Americans. <laughs> we don't follow that. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Sorry. Uh, this has nothing to do with sports. This has nothing to do with making a good grade on the test. This has nothing to do with uh, your business going well. This has nothing to do with your ability to succeed in the marketplace. This has nothing to do with the stock market. This has nothing to do with a, an absurd amount of things that we want to shove into this verse. What is the context here? The context is giving and supporting those who are doing ministry. Like That is the context. So... With that as our backdrop and our context, let's read this most highly contested verse. I am able to do, all of that is one word. It's a singular present active indicative. So right now, Paul is able to do all things. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, yeah, that's fine. We'll skip that one. Uh, I am able to do all things. The all means all, absolutely. Through is a terrible translation. <laughs> what is the Greek word? In. In. Yes, I'm able to do all things in. And I wouldn't add the him either. It helps in English. It helps immensely in English. And your footnote is terrible because it's a really disputed uh, variant. But they want to throw it in there because so many other translations say, I can do all things in Christ. But please understand, neither Jesus nor a pronoun referencing him is in Philippians 4.13. He's not there. He's added in our English translations to make it very clear to whom we are referring because the word strengthens is a what? It's a verb. You're like, what? Yes. And it's a present active participle. Now, who is doing the strengthening? Christ is... Like, don't miss. I, like, I literally took him out of the sentence because he's technically not there. But boy, oh boy, is he there. Right? Boy, oh boy, is he there. And he is present active participle there. Like, this is his habit. This is what Jesus just does. This is his norm, is to strengthen us. <sighs> How awesome is that? Like, that is encouraging. That is encouraging. It's only used seven times in the New Testament. And it is always used in the context of service to God. It is never used. Well, he strengthened me, so I made it to church this morning. Uh, maybe, maybe... He strengthened me so that we won that game. I, well, all glory to God. He gave me the ability to do this. and I could. No. Like definitive, hard, no. Stop. Athletes, stop getting tattoos of this on your body. Like don't let your kids, like this is bad theology. Don't do that. So here's the seven times it's used in the New Testament. Acts 9.22, Romans 4.20. Ephesians 6.10, Philippians 4.13, 1 Timothy 1.12, 2 Timothy 2.1, 2 Timothy 4.17. What do those have in common? Well, the last six were all written by Paul. The first one was written about Paul. This is a very Pauline word. And I love that he roots it in Christ. So, application here at the bottom of page 117. Christians only have the ability to do all things in our strengthener. Christians only have the ability to do all things in our strengthener. And who is that? Christ. It's our Lord Jesus Christ, yes. Christians only have the ability to do all things in our strengthener. That was fun. Oh, okay, cool. I didn't know you could do that. Uh, and then number two, all things, and I have that in air quotes here, all things in context is about ministry work. All things in context is about ministry work. So when you hear this word used in a way that is not talking about ministry work, eh, do not go, do not pay, collect $200. Open up your Bible and read the whole chapter. Like, it is a great way to guard against, I'll pluck this and I'll pluck that and I'll pluck this and I will not actually understand who our God is, which is terrible. All right. I hoped to make as little about that as possible. Now that we are past verse 13, uh, Lord willing, next week we will pick up with verse 14. Uh, I think verse 14 actually goes with the next paragraph better, but I won't fight you over it if you disagree. So it's okay. It's good. All right. So that's, uh, we're about halfway through chapter, a little over halfway through chapter four now. I'm excited. And uh, that's the lesson for today. So you should have your weekly updates on your table. So if you do, uh, grab one of those, pair up with some folks, 
share prayer requests, lean in, engage, pray, and then go worship this one whose habit it is to strengthen us, to do the work he has called us to do in a unified way so that we can then go and rejoice in him because he is who it is all about. Thanks, guys.